and we'll get started in uh, maybe another minute. Yeah, okay, we're live now, so let's we'll get started, okay? Um, hello, everyone. We've made it to the end. <laughs> so um, I'm really, I think we have a great group of people speaking with us tonight. So um, I hope you enjoy it. They are all. Um, about to complete their MFAs here at Syracuse University. Um, and uh, I just wanna welcome you to the last Visiting Artists Lecture Series of spring 2021. Um, so the way tonight will work is each artist will speak for about around 10 minutes and then there'll be some time for a question and answer. So please everyone, both on YouTube and on Zoom, please put your questions and comments in the chat. Um, so the first artist who's gonna to speak tonight is Anshel uh, Ray Shahib, who, and she was born and raised in uh, Chandigarh, India. She received her BFA in printmaking from Punjab University in 2013. Um, and her work explores the ambiguity that arises from the displacement of cultural context. And I'll let her uh, talk about that more. So Anshel. Take Thanks, it away. Joanna. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen and then I'm going to do the mandatory. Can you see my screen? So someone please tell me. Yes. Okay, great. Let's get this started. Okay. Hello everyone. My name is Anjan Rai Sahib and I'm a third year MFA candidate in studio arts. So through my work, I document experiences of acclimating to a foreign culture while remaining connected to my roots. I moved from India to the United States in 2017. And this experience of moving from one country to another is what inspires my practice. You know, I talk about themes of cultural identity, longing and nostalgia through my work. And the way that I approach that is through the use of material that holds personal or cultural significance. And that familiarity of the material acts as a constant amidst this chaos of displacement and uncertainty. When I use that familiarity as a foundation, I can build new narratives that allow me to address experience, you know, my experiences as an international student or as an outsider. So before I talk about my thesis work, I wanted to talk about the breakthroughs that I've had in the last three years. Um, and I'm going to start with undergrad. So I did my undergrad with a specialization in printmaking. And you know, undergrad for me was all about methods and materials, about learning printmaking and about being a proficient printmaker. And there weren't a lot of conversations that were happening around concepts or ideas. So when I moved to the United States and decided to get an MFA, you know, when I saw the work that was being done here, I thought to myself, well, I have moved to a new country. I'm joining a new program. I might as well push my boundaries and try something new. And that push, you know, the first step was venturing into three dimension. And my first sculpture was tipping point. Um, this was in 2018. So as someone who's between two cultures, there's a very interesting dynamic that happens with identity. You know, I don't want to alienate myself from my roots, but I'm also fascinated with assimilating into a new culture. And I wanted to embody the tension between wanting these two things. So the panel that's on the right, I see that as my Indian identity, which is all about learning, growing up. So accumulating experiences. And then the panel that's on the left is about unlearning and relearning, which was how I acclimated to the United States. So I made the panel on the left, but I washed it. And then I sewed on patches on that surface in order to signify that unlearning and relearning. 
And these two panels are connected by this system of tendrils that goes between the two. You know, it's this idea of embodying that tension that I felt because these were two identities that were existing inside me. And what this piece really did was it opened up my mind to the significance of material and process. You know, what they add to the piece when it's complete and the tactile nature of material. So I started to think about that. But despite venturing into three dimension, there was still a part of me that was holding back or I was working with size that was manageable. So I think the next breakthrough that happened for me was in terms of size, in terms of understanding this idea of transformation. Um, this installation is titled Almost Home. And at the center of the installation is a tree trunk that's carved. And the fabric that's on the top are saris that I got from my grandmother. And it was an interactive piece. So you could um, you know, interact with the piece, you could sit on that bench. So before I made this piece, I had visited India over the winter break and I'd visited India after a year. So, you know, experiencing India again felt like I had opened these floodgates to emotions that I hadn't felt in a really long time, but I was only there for 14 days. So there was an abrupt end to that experience. You know, when I came back and I started spring semester, I was feeling this intense longing. I was missing home and, you know, it had gotten to the point where it became debilitating. I couldn't focus on anything else. I was, all I wanted to do was look at images from the trip and really just re try and relive those memories. So, you know, in the studio, I started thinking about, okay, how can I fix this? what is the solution to this conundrum that I'm having? So I thought if I cannot go back home, I will bring home to me. And that was the inception of this idea, to create a space that would aid reminiscence, to create a space that would help me indulge in nostalgia. So like I said, the you know, at the center of the installation, the tree trunk is inspired by a people tree um, which is a tree that's only found on the Indian subcontinent. It's also known as Ficus religiosa. And I wanted to, you know, have this idea of sort of bringing that tree to the United States. So it's actually built out of two by sixes. So first I assembled two by sixes into a cylinder and then I started carving. And, you know, when I was carving, I was spending about six to seven hours every day carving the tree. And that immersion in the process really allowed me to fine tune the idea and understand the intentions behind my actions. You know, spending so much time with the material really helped me carve literally or how I was gonna talk about it. And, you know, this was one piece where I really gave into the idea in the sense that there was an honest transaction, you know, I thought what I'm experiencing right now, this longing, this intense longing, feels like it's bigger than me. So the artwork that I'm creating in response needs to be bigger than all human presence. And that idea really liberated me. You know, this idea of I have to give this work my all. I think that's when I really found my, you know, my artistic personalities, how I like to work is one, I tend to use a lot of repetition. And two, I like spending time with the material, which in a way is very similar to how I used to work as a printmaker. You know, it was all about re repeated lines and then creating that plate. Um, and, uh, you know, okay, I'm gonna, this is, I just wanted to throw this in because there was a lot of behind the scenes and, <laughs> This is how much I was immersed in the making. I was literally inside the tree. Um, anyways, I'm going to move on to my thesis work now. So this is the first piece that's in the thesis exhibition. This object is titled A Precarious Life. And through this work, I really wanted to honor this experience of building a new life in a new country. 
you know, the hard work and uncertainty that are both equal parts of this life. So the egg is a universal representation of a potential or a future. And I've covered it with basmati rice. So basmati rice is considered a premium quality of rice because of the length of the grain. But back in India, because it is a whole grain, it's considered auspicious. So if there's a ceremony like a wedding or a housewarming, basmati rice would become a part of that ritual as a way of signifying auspiciousness. So covering the surface of the egg with the rice is a way of manifesting a future. It's a way of manifesting the dreams and aspirations with which I moved to this country. And you know, at its basis, this work is really about the hard work that goes in every day. So every grain of rice is embedded into the surface of the egg. And that embedding is very similar to, you know, this idea of opening up potential or planting a seed, which all circles back to building a new life. And the other thing that's a part of this wonderfully complex life is the uncertainty and the false sense of stability. You know, everything that I've built for myself in the last four years is dependent on this one piece of paper, which is my visa, which is regulated by the government. So they get to decide how long I can stay here in the United States and what are the rules and regulations that I need to abide by. So in a way, the control of my life lies outside of me. And that's also where the egg comes in. You know, when an egg is standing upright, it's one of the strongest forms in nature. And that's why when you crack an egg, you crack it on the side. So presenting the egg like that in an upright position is a way of embodying that fragility of this life because even a slight nudge can cause a lot of damage. Okay, moving on to something that's not as fragile. The next piece that's in the show are these portals. Um, this installation is titled Portals Reweaving the Present. So I haven't visited India in more than two years now and you know, that physical distance also distances you psychologically. So as someone who's standing at the boundary, I can look back with a critical lens. And what that has made me realize is that I grew up amongst a lot of patriarchy and misogyny, and now, which caused me to internalize it. And now it's up to me to undo it. So these portals are a mechanism towards that introspection. Essentially, these are weavings. So I've built a framework for myself. And I wanted to use this idea of fabric as a foundation. You know, when we talk about the fabric of a society or space-time fabric, we are inherently referencing a foundation. And the way that I approach this is again, through the deconstruction of materials. So fabrics like saris and headscarves, they can be gendered by themselves, but when I break them down and create a new foundation, you know, they, they start to become they start to account for the voices of their original form, but they're building a newer narrative. And this, you know, this process of undoing internalized misogyny is such a personal and vulnerable process because you're breaking down your foundations, you're deconstructing them, you're opening them up and deciding, you know, what do you want to go forward with and what do you want to get rid of? So there's a lot of travel and there's a lot of looking inside and the centers of these portals these whirlpools are supposed to represent that movement you know that looking in traveling back in time because you have to look back at the cultural constructs the social norms that i was a part of which of those do i want to keep you know what am i projecting into the future what am i not taking with me what am i changing so there's a lot of looking in and a lot of looking back and the you know the centers are that sort of mechanism for activation and you know making these portals was a very slow contemplative meditation and i was very present in the process so i would measure out the amount of you know yarn i need then i would cut the fabric i would make sure that because of the friction i don't fray the edges so making this whole installation was like a quiet contemplation of being with yourself. And I think if you, as a viewer, when you stand in front of them, 
if you give them enough time, they can start to function as a portal where hopefully they can make you look inside and maybe question some of your own ideals. Thank you. Thank you, Anshel. That was really very eloquent talk. Um, Thank you. And a great way to start us off. So again, please remember to ask questions, especially we're going to be hearing from several people tonight. So as you're thinking of them, please put them in the chat and we'll come back and talk to Anshel. Um, our next artist tonight who will be speaking is uh, Trey Braswell. He is an illustrator and an artist, and he's also uh, about to finish his MFA in illustration here at Syracuse University. Um, Trey creates concept art, children's books, and comics that celebrate Black lives and explore African heroes and myths. And he's going to be sharing some of his thesis work with us tonight as well. So Trey, I turn it over to you. <laughs> Sounds good, sounds good. Let me just share my screen. Uh, okay. Share screen. All right. Can y'all see the screen? Yes. Yep. All right, great. So I'll start by just like telling a few things about myself. I uh, graduated from undergrad in 2018 from Mississippi State University. And my focus uh, concentration was fine arts and painting because before I did digital work, I mostly did like oil paints and acrylic paints. So my mentor at uh, my undergrad actually went to Syracuse University for grad school and he, uh, oh, and he uh, got me in contact with James Ransom because they're really good friends. And I applied uh, during my last year of undergrad and wanted to pursue my, I guess, craft digitally, because I feel like I had a good base of fine arts, traditional work. And so how I plan to start this talk off is by basically just showing some of my personal work that you know, I've done since I've been at Q's and then end it with my thesis work. And so I wanna start by saying that I do a lot of uh, really just like strictly flat out black art because uh, for me growing up as a black kid in America, we had very little representation on the TV screen, the movie screen, uh, comics. And so whenever I saw one character of color, I would get really hyped about that. And so I wanna create content that makes other kids feel the same way that I did growing up. And so I wanna start the talk up by showing a few of my horoscope pieces I've done since I've been accused. Uh, I've done nine so far, but these two are a couple of my favorites I've done. Uh, they're both done in Photoshop. And I had the idea of doing these, I guess, horoscope, heroic, uh, hero type characters. So for the Sagittarius on the right, he is a mix of a uh, cheetah and human. Uh, kind of like a flip on like the horse and centaur man. But since it's African thing, I want to have a similar concept for each of the characters. And so I have more to show later on, but these are two of my favorite ones I've done. And last year for Black History Month, I did a piece of some cartoon characters that I watched growing up. And I wanted to do something different for Black History Month because every year, uh, for me personally, I see the same pictures of the same people of the civil rights activists, MLK, Malcolm X, uh, Rosa Parks. Not that it's a bad thing, but I wanted to be some. I wanted to do something different for my art page, and so I thought to myself, how can I stand out a little bit? And I'm on cross with Black cartoons because they are also a part of Black History Month because at some point, a couple of decades ago, they weren't a thing. So I thought, would it, be, would it be cool to have them all in one scene as a reunion, cook out maybe, or get together? So I just did like a collage of some of my favorite characters that I watched growing up. And this is the outcome of it. Um, it was really personal for me, very fun to do and a lot of shows that I could think of that I liked growing up. And yeah, this is the outcome of that. 
The next one I want to show was the one I did last year, last summer after George Floyd got killed. Uh, I wanted to do a piece where it hit me emotionally because uh, this piece here was the first piece I've ever did where everyone pictured was deceased. So for me, it was very hard to do because as I'm representing the drawings I'm doing for each person, I'm looking at someone who's not with us anymore. And I had a lot of like hard times trying to finish it because I just couldn't really do it like too long per day because I would just like get really, I would struggle a lot trying to finish it because I saw myself in their place. You know, what if it happened to me? Uh, would my story be out there? Would it not be out there? Because it's a lot of stories that aren't told, that aren't recorded. So this one really just hits home for me uh, personally. So, yeah. Uh, next we have the one I did for Black History Month this year, uh, my take on The Last Supper. Uh, some of my favorite uh, civil rights activists, Black history uh, character people, so from left to right, we have Fannie Lou Hamer, Rosa Parks, uh, Kamala Harris, John Lewis, Frederick Douglass, Malcolm X, MLK, Obama, Harriet, that is Ali, Muhammad Ali, Jackie Robinson, Ida B. Wells, Shirley, Shirley Chisholm, and that last one, is, oh, I forgot his name, uh, I have a uh, mind block, but uh, he is uh, Thurgood Marshall, that's his name, Thurgood Marshall, yeah. So for this piece here, I wanted to like have fun with it. I wanted to show them outside of their position in the world, have them place in a fun environment, uh, a cookout, if you will, a barbecue, just having fun, laughing around, hanging out, getting together kind of similar to the one I did last year, the uh, Black Cartoon Reunion, and just having them socializing outside of their normalized environment. And next I'll be talking about my thesis work. So continuing the Black art theme, I'm taking African mythology figures from the Yoruba religion and creating them as if they were super heroic warriors of Africa. So I chose six specific characters in mind, and I'm only showing three for the sake of time. And I want to like create these characters based off the research idea for each one, based off their, I guess, their stories, uh, where they're from, where the people that worship them believe in, how they dress. So I designed them based off, you know, the clothing that they wore for that country, for that area. Uh, their powers are based off, you know, the environment as well. And the first one I'm showing is a Ganju. He is the Orisha or the god of volcanoes and the wilderness. And for him, I wanted to have a very hot character with a very strong build, um, sturdy like a volcano, if you will. So he's really big. I kind of like base his style off the Hulk, but Kind of like the Hulk, he gets angrier, the, uh, he gets bigger, the more angry he is. But unlike the Hulk, his hands and feet also get hotter, the angrier he gets. So his powers form from his hands and his feet. So the more mad he gets, he's gonna get hotter in temperature and in size. So this is a uh, character sheet I did for him. Really muscular, really big bite, build sturdy and a lot of the pattern designs on his pants, on his uh, cloth hanging down are tribal patterns for the, uh, the people that worship him. They wear the similar type of triangle shaped designs, trying to like tie along the countries that uh, involve him. And the next character I did for my thesis is Ayao. She is the goddess of the air. So she protects Africa from the skies to protect uh, demons and evil spirits from uh, disguise. And for her, her costume colors are green and yellow-ish. I read somewhere that her favorite colors are earth tone because she's always in the skies. So she's always seeing like the ground, the trees from above. 
So I wanted to add those type of colors into her outfit. And the wings on her afro was like a second thought because I wanted to have a different type of god, like eagle, I guess, like character to her. So when she flies, the wings in her hair and on her back help her with her flight as well. It's similar to a Ganji, she has a triangle, tribal paint uh, on her clothing and her patterns to help, I guess, unify the people she protects in different countries or whatever. And keep that, I guess, unified pattern to show that these are, you know, Africa's pantheon or a few of them for the Yoruba religion. And the last one I wanted to show for my thesis is Yamoja. She is the goddess of the seven seas. She is, I guess, she, she protects all the waters besides Africa's surrounding waters. So she is probably the hardest working of most of the guys that I've researched because she has a lot of areas to cover since Earth is 70% water. So for her, I wanted to be very like, very strong, very independent, very like, you know, I guess strong-minded in her character and her outfit. And a lot of the stories I read, uh, for, they had, I guess, represented her as a mermaid. So I kept that design for her as well. I gave her uh, some kind of like wave uh, marks in her outfit for her necklace, for her chest uh, part area, for armor area. And she controls all the sea animals, all living things in the waters and protects from the, uh, the depths below. But the last thing I wanted to show was uh, the few that I've decided to do my thesis on. So similar to uh, the three before, these are the uh, my lineup for the characters I picked to do my thesis on. And Ananzi is uh, the trickster god. He is told in stories to be spider-like and a villain, if you will. So in my storyline for my thesis, he's the, the main villain for the story. And Achosi on the left hand, he is the god of the hunt. He is the world's best uh, hunter, fisherman, and very skilled fighter. And he protects uh, in the woods, hidden away from everyone else. Ocean is the goddess of fertility, motherhood, and beauty. And she is the mother in my story that I have planned out for my thesis work. She uh, makes sure everyone is safe and sound, all the while it's protecting them from Anansi because he's trying to take their powers for himself. And so this is the line that I had created early on. They're not fully developed just yet, but uh, once I finish doing the work for them, I'll update the lineup with the fully detailed work. And that is it for all I have to show. Thank you for your time. And uh, I have more of my work for my horoscope pieces, my uh, thesis work on my website and my art Instagram page. So you can find more work on there on what I can do. Thank you. Thank you, Trey. It's really great to see, see that work. So, um, okay, and please, again, ask questions about Trey's work yeah, in the chat. Um, we'll yeah. take questions at the, at the end if that's okay. Um, okay. Yeah, um, but try to do it now while you're thinking of it. So, okay, um, our next speaker is uh, Caitlin Brumfield. Um, Caitlin grew up in Madison County, Kentucky and earned her bachelor's degree. Um, oops, I just turned on my video, sorry. And this voice in the void. Okay, sorry about that. So Caitlin grew up in Madison County, Kentucky. She earned her bachelor's degree in art history and studio art from the University of Louisville. Her most recent work, as we're going to learn, learn about, draws from material culture and Appalachian agrarianism to create ritual settings for ecological mourning. Um, and I will let Caitlin take it from here. Okay, so I guess I have, I can screen share. Um, so, um, Again, I'll kind of say, oh crap, how can I? Sorry, it's not letting me view. Um, okay, there it goes. Um, 
Okay, so uh, just to reiterate, um, my name is Caitlin Brumfield. I'm a third year MFA candidate in studio art. And for a long time, my work has been about issues of ecology and especially recently, my work has become really focused on this sort of emergent phenomenon of ecological grief, which is co-occurring with global crises like climate change and mass extinction and land degradation. So some of my earlier work in grad school was um, pretty um, focused in drawing. Um, so this is a drawing uh, installation I did about uh, bird extinctions. Um, I've also done a lot of landscape um, drawings sort of about the, the uncanny kind of altered landscape um, that we inhabit in this epoch known as the Anthropocene. Um, but I'm really sort of more um, recently interested in ecological grief as it applies to uh, specific regions. So I think some of my, my earlier work is more global. Um, it takes kind of this macro lens um, at, at sort of big issues like climate change and mass extinction. But my recent work, um, partially due to the circumstances of COVID, has become very um, place-based. And all of these recent projects are about the places where I'm from, uh, the places where my, my family lives in Kentucky and sort of the Appalachian region. So I'll start with this project. Um, I started this project at the very beginning of um, COVID-19. So as things were starting to shut down, I left Syracuse and I went to stay with my sister in Louisville. And she had this magnolia tree in the yard and I didn't have any art supplies with me. So I just sort of intuitively started to embroider these magnolia leaves. And at first I didn't exactly know what I was doing with them. Um, obviously there's an association with feminine craft traditions um, and they look very female. So um, I thought about it more. Eventually this became a project about my, my great grandmother who was a subsistence farmer in Appalachia. And she had this very traditional life and this very close connection with the land. Um, and through my research into family history and um, feminine agrarian culture, um, I became really inspired by this ethic of ecological stewardship that is very inherent to the feminine way of life um, or the feminine agrarian uh, culture of, of the Appalachian region. And for this project, I'm really identifying that ethic of stewardship in the art of quilt making. So to display these leaves that I was embroidering, I decided to build this traditional hand quilting frame. And so nowadays this is kind of an obscure artifact. Like as I was building this thing, nobody knew what it was. Um, but, but traditionally back in the day, um, women would sit around these quilt frames and they, it was done by hand and it was done collectively. So quilt making was kind of the social activity and these frames were really the centerpiece of feminine agrarian communities. So multiple generations of women, you know, grandmothers and granddaughters would sit together um, in this activity of quilt making. And there was sort of this act of preservation, not only in, in the quilts themselves, where you know, you're taking the rags of cloth that's been worn out and, and repurposing it into something that can be passed down. You know, that similar gesture of preservation is happening uh, culturally where women are, are sort of uh, communicating local knowledge and local memory between members of their community. Um, so that sustainability again is, is sort of inherent to this act um, of quilt making. So this is the final piece. Um, I built this uh, quilt frame and, I, and I'm just stringing the threaded magnolia leaves over the bars. Um, they're sort of in this gridded arrangement that's reminiscent of a patchwork quilt. And I was really intending for this piece to be kind of a commemorative piece. Because um, I think this culture of, of uh, farming in Appalachia uh, is so often stereotyped as backwards, like mountain people are talked about as like rednecks and hicks. And there's actually a great amount of wisdom and, and sophistication that is um, a part of this culture. And I really wanna honor that and especially sort of the feminine side of that culture. Um, but this is also sort of a, a memorial in a sense because you know, not only is the region being compromised ecologically 
through things like mountaintop removal, coal mining, um, but the cultural landscape is changing too, where like, you know, nobody quilts like this anymore. Nobody lives off the land um, and farms uh, like they did, you know, back in my great grandparents' time. Um, and it's really been made impossible because of the degradation of that landscape. So, um, you know, I'm mourning not only that region uh, ecologically, but I'm also doing this as a gesture of grief um, in honor of the, the cultural values and principles that are also in a sense going extinct. Um, and so this is the, the second project in my thesis exhibition. Um, and it's based on a funerary tree from a novel by James Still called River of Earth. And um, this novel is kind of a, a classic work of Appalachian literature. It's set in Eastern Kentucky during the years of the Great Depression. And it follows this family as they're kind of torn between, um, you know, a subsistence farming lifestyle and life in the coal camps. And again, in the story, there's this very gender dynamic where the women are really the stewards of the land. So the mother is really adamant. She wants to stay um, on the farmstead. She wants to earn an honest living, um, living off the land. And the father is just convinced that the only way to provide for the family is to get a job in the coal camp and to move between company towns. Um, and so it's a very, obviously very boom and bust industry. So throughout the novel, this, this family is going through these cycles of destitution. Um, and eventually at one point in the novel, their youngest child um, named Green dies of a common childhood illness. And as a way of mourning the loss of her child, the mother makes this egg tree um, or she decorates this tree in the yard with uh, hollowed out eggshells. And um, shortly thereafter, the father announces that he's gotten um, a job in, a, in another company town or at another coal mine and is moving the family yet again um, to this recently opened mine. And the mother at this point is really not wanting to leave um, this particular farmstead, um, mostly because she does not want to leave the place where the baby is buried. Um, but she doesn't say that. She says, um, you know, I worked so hard on my egg tree. I don't, I don't want to leave my egg tree. Um, so, the, so the father actually pulls the tree out of the ground and they take it with them into the coal camp. And so this, this is sort of a recreation of that tree where again, it's uprooted. Um, it's, it's kind of alienated from the land and that is to symbolize um, the erosion of place. In some instances, the actual destruction of place like because of mountaintop removal, there are areas of Appalachia that don't exist anymore. Um, so it's partially referencing that. Um, but I'm also thinking of this gesture of maternal grief as a way to start to articulate the collective anxiety that a lot of people are feeling for future generations um, with what's happening with, with climate change and, and pollution and other eco catastrophes. I think a lot of people um, are really worried and really concerned about the, the world that our children are going to inherit. So this is also um, a piece about that kind of grief. And, um, and I'm, I'm actually, um, again, this is sort of referencing my great grandmother's experience. Um, so I'm using her buttons from her sewing collection uh, as a way to hang the eggshells for this particular version of the tree. Um, and, and that's, I wanted to incorporate her again, because this is really like very close to her experience. And my, my grandmother actually lost her first child um, in infancy uh, to scarlet fever. So it's, it's also a way for me to kind of incorporate her and honor her grief um, and to link that grief to sort of the imminent collective grief that we will experience, um, you know, worldwide. So uh, I think that is it. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, it's always good to see your work, so. Um, all right, our last speaker tonight, last but not least is um, Catherine or Katie Spencer, who is from rural upstate New York. Um, Katie received her bachelor in fine arts in, in painting at Alfred University. 
and will be graduating from uh, Studio Arts uh, in, with her MFA this May. Uh, Katie uses a wide range of materials to create environments um, as forms of escapism, as well as the distortion of emotional pain. And we'll let Katie take us there. Um, take it away, Katie. <laughs> Let me share screen here. All right, so um, yeah, my name is Katie. There's a little close up of my thesis. Um, take that one, let me go to the next slide here. Hold on, there we go. Okay, so I wanted to start off by showing you guys a little bit of um, where I grew up. I'm actually from Homer, New York, which is like you know, half hour away from here. And um, I grew up in a, a valley right down the road from a lake, um, big uh, farm town. We had these really beautiful, um, I can't remember exactly what they're called. I wanna say that they're some sort of Japanese invasive species. And um, they would create this giant canopy of leaves. And you could literally run, well, my sisters and I would run through there um, and it was kind of like we were escaping into a new world. There were tons of um, old farm equipment pieces lying around our backyard that the previous owner had just like dumped all their like garbage in this one section. So every year the water would um, flood and we would have to unearth all of these random things and clean it up. So uh, yeah, that was, part of that experience. Uh, so I was a really curious, weird child and I was really interested in nature um, aesthetically. So I was always looking at things up close, trying to figure out like, what, what the heck is this thing? What does it do? Um, like equally disgusted and like curious about everything around me. So these are some things that I would also look at. Um, lots of bizarre plants out there. Um, and then I went to undergrad and I started getting really interested in um, microscopy and anything under the microscope, really all of these like unseen worlds that are going on behind um, or like in front of us that we can't really see. So I um, started getting really into that and I graduated, moved to Cleveland, started making paintings like this. Um, I I was really interested in painting, um, didn't really know exactly how to convey my thoughts or ideas quite yet. Um, they were a little bit more emotion based because of, um, you know, I didn't really know how to explain like all of my concepts through my work yet. So when I applied, um, it was right around the same time that Trump was elected and um, my work shifted really quickly because I really wanted, um, I really wanted order and this kind of like chaos that I was experiencing. And um, so everything became somewhat more angular, still somewhat organic, but there were um, a lot more straight edges. Um, still, still thinking about these as kind of windows into my own little world that was going on in my head and how I was thinking and perceiving of things. Um, but they weren't necessarily um, doing exactly what I wanted them to do. So I ended up right when I got actually to Syracuse, I didn't have a studio yet. So for two weeks, I made these little collages in my apartment uh, where I would just take construction paper pen um, and pastels and cut up papers and then just like play with them on the floor. So I do that for hours and hours and hours and they became these little um, kind of like autonomous objects. Whereas the paintings were all of these, like this is the whole image. So um, it was kind of difficult for me to contend with that, um, especially after, you know, my first critique and everything. So. Uh, everybody saw those and they were like, why don't you do three-dimensional paintings? So I started doing these little guys where I was trying to basically control the, um, the form of the object with paint. So again, like another way that I'm trying to control space uh, with form and color, but um, yeah, also trying to kind of see if I can 
um, manipulate how you perceive these objects. The uh, happy accident that came about with these are these shadows that they created. Um, they're actually pretty interesting. So, and then let's see. Um, after that, I jumped into playing around with this um, insulation foam that I had found. So I had joint compound, I had wall, like regular wall paint, and then I had this like bright neon paint. So I started covering these with joint compound, well, cutting them up, shaping them, um, and then covering them with joint compound, letting them dry, and then covering them with paint so that I could do some sort of uh, three-dimensional collage. Um, so that I could kind of bridge the, the painting, the three-dimensional work and the collage all together in one space. And one of the things that I was really um, playing around in this series, it's a, a series of five pieces. I'm only gonna show you two because these are the only ones I really like. Um, but I basically set up a new installation every day where I would go in and like re-establish the whole space. And it's called, um, if you touch me, things will fall and I will die because literally everything is balanced to the space. So people who go through the space are a little bit more um, cautious of their own behavior and their bodies and the effect that they have on their environment, which is something that I wanted to um, talk about because um, as I mentioned before, I was uh, kind of obsessed with politics and just this feeling of a lack of control. So I was like, okay, so I don't really necessarily have control, but I do know that I, like, even as a small person, I do have impact, um, good or bad. So um, in this space, if you knock it over, you literally, you have the power to um, destroy or keep this space as it is. Um, and I thought that that was pretty interesting. And then I was also playing around with um, the relationships that these forms have individually with each other as well. But I wasn't sure exactly how to um, talk about that yet. Um, there's another thing that you probably might notice uh, visually. Um, I have this bizarre obsession with um, like windows or um, the, that like square form where you're peering through into other things. Um, and I think that also goes back to painting and how like you're seeing through into, it's like a portal into a new space. Um, I think about sight, just like how our eyes are the portals to the soul. So um, I think I'm trying to reference like seeing beyond just the, the initial thing that you're initially seeing. Um, uh, and then I started getting into the neon paint a little bit more. I went back to painting again because I um, was just kind of confused about my whole practice and like, oh no, what do I, <laughs> what do I do now? So I painted a little bit and I found that um, the neon paint and um, there's this other golden brand of paint called interference paint and it literally changes with the light. Um, so depending on the time of the day, depending on how it's lit, it looks totally different. So it's kind of hard to photograph. Um, same with this little installation I did. Um, so still trying to play around with um, manipulating perspective and how I can talk about, you know, how, how things in the world can be manipulated as well. And then I um, was taking a digital sculpture class along with my regular classes. And I started doing this um, I, I did this little show called Vacation where I was thinking about uh, escapism, trying to um, play around with this. The, the reflective material is called iridescent mylar. And uh, it's essentially like a reflective plastic and it, it also shifts when you look at it in different ways and it kind of masks the um, reality of the material underneath, what I, which I really liked. Um, and then the image on the right is essentially me trying to, um, well, I created an Instagram filter for that class so that I could, you could walk into the space and you could literally become the art so that you're, you're escaping yourself and you're just part of the art as well. Um, and then 
I went to LA for the Turner semester residency with Anshul actually. And um, I was interning with Kyla at the time and she uses a lot of found objects. So, I, and I had um, brought some of my old parents' railings with me to see if I could um, play around with that somehow. And I was working on trying to make freestanding sculptures so that I didn't have to rely on just the balance. Um, and this was obviously before COVID that I finished this um, and I called it IV because I was thinking a lot about the healthcare system because my, my dad had just gotten surgery and um, it was kind of terrifying to see him lying in the hospital bed with all these tubes and everything. And then I um, also saw a Ree Morton show um, out there with Kyla um, and the show was called uh, the plant that heals also poisons. So um, kind of this idea of e e things can be both good and bad. And that's kind of how I view the healthcare system. It's, it's something that um, obviously heals people. And then there's also the negative side of that where the system's set up so that most people can't afford regular healthcare on their own and are just kind of left on their or if they go in there and they get help, then maybe they're bankrupted by all of the medical bills they receive afterwards. Um, and then I also was playing around with these more flat surface paintings that I did, but i um, not really interested in talking about that. Um, probably the most um, substantial thing in terms of my development and what I created for my thesis is what I did here. Um, I made these physical filters. So I was taking pictures of my sculptures through these filters, like physical, like I was thinking about dig the digital world and how you can literally put a filter on, the whole reality of the situation is changed. So how it's perceived is also changed. So um, this was after the pandemic had hit and we were about to leave. So it felt very apocalyptic to me. And I started doing these, um, these little pictures here. Um, and then we came back and we didn't have a studio for quite a while. And then when we did, I chopped up a bunch of my old pieces and started playing with this wax where um, I was literally melting it into the polystyrene insulation foam. Um, yeah, it was, it was a really traumatic summer. I'm sure we can all agree on that. So I was trying to figure out how to get all of those emotions out. Um, so this, this is a very reactionary piece. Um, same with the piece on the right here. I named that um, self-sabotage because it's kind of this weird abstracted object is holding the hammer that's used to well, it's not really the actual hammer that was used to create those holes, but um, yeah, I was trying to, I was thinking of bodies and how I can give these, these things wounds. And um, I can't remember if I took a soci, I took a sociology class, um, I think before LA, and it was on um, early childhood development and trauma and how your DNA literally changes after you experience trauma or how your body reads your DNA. So different parts of your DNA uncoil and you, 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 your physical and mental body change. So um, I was thinking a lot about that um, in my practice because a lot of my objects I reuse. So I'm thinking of them as like, so, well, essentially it's my process is that um, I'll create these objects, I break them down and then I fix them. So um, in, this, in this piece, I have a lot of old broken pieces that I reconfigured and put back together again to um, create this show, um, which I called Extra. It was um, kind of a play on words. Um, I was thinking about like how, how we have all of this extra material right, lying around just because we live in excess, um, extraterrestrial because it's kind of an alien space. Um, and this is where I really started using 
color colored lights in the space. Um, I had EL wire, I think it's electroluminescent. So it literally, you can make it blank. It's, it's kind of a um, poor man's neon. <laughs> and uh, I like them because you can kind of um, dangle them and they're just a little bit creepier than neon, but still have a similar effect. Um, so this was an important show for me. And then um, Katie Shulman and I did a, an experimental show um, at Random Access called A Waltz Between Worlds, where we kind of played with our objects together in the space and trying to redefine those relationships and figure out what that meant. Um, for me, this was uh, really helpful in terms of thinking about creating structures differently. So I started, um, Katie uses these tomato cages for a lot of her um, pieces. And so I started using tomato cages, but um, filling them with light and um, also yarn. I use tool and here more LE wire or EL wire, sorry. Um, and I was thinking about these as being um, these like hanging fruits almost, or uh, these kind of eerie beings hanging in space. Um, still thinking about the digital space and how, uh, you know, when you're, well, not everyone has played video games, but in a lot of video games, there's a certain point where um, you are rewarded in some way with like coins or something to keep you kind of hooked in that loop. So I was really playing with that idea with um, these objects that I was making. And then I, um, so this is my thesis work, um, which I named uh, Subliminal Stimuli, because I was uh, really interested in how uh, the digital space is becoming more and more prevalent in our world and how um, everything that we're absorbing on there is um, we're, we're literally, it's, it's in our brain somehow, whether we're conscious of it or not. And I wanted to um, create a space that was immersive and um, was similar to the dopamine hit that you would get in some sort of video game, or even if you're just trying to dissociate watching Netflix for 10 hours, um, it's like that sort of escape from reality. That's like, it's, it's so much more exciting. It's so much more vibrant and intense than reality. Um, so it's uh, hard to have like those mundane moments when you have these extreme, extreme spaces where you can um, escape. Um, and I was also playing with this. Um, sorry, <laughs> am I going over? Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm trying to. I'll wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, this space was really inspired by COVID because I wanted to talk about um, all of these information bubbles with the insulation foam and um, also the trauma that has come from that with the trauma blankets that are up at the top of the ceiling. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. And then, oh, I think I have, oh yeah. And this is what I'm working on right now in my studio. Um, <laughs> we're hanging things. And these are some of the artists that I'm looking at. Um, Rachel Harrison, uh, Jessica Stockholder, um, Matthew Rone, Alex Court, and uh, Hilma Offquin. It's always one of my favorites. That's it. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. Uh, let me, let's see. Let's try to, so um, we have some questions. Um, let's see. Um, Katie, since you're here, we'll start with, um, well, there's one from Nicole that goes to all of you, but Katie, maybe you can start and we can work our way backwards. Um, as Syracuse students, what would be the best advice you would give to freshman undergrads who are who are just starting the studio program here? Mm, my advice would be to find the things that um, you're kind of obsessed with, like things that you you're always thinking about, so that you can 
build off of those interests to create some sort of studio practice for yourself. How about uh, Trey, any advice? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest thing that I learned uh, overall through my experience here is to just take what you like the most, whatever you want to do, focus your work or your art on and develop that and make it your own thing. Don't be a copycat. Don't try to be like someone else. Do you follow your heart, follow what you enjoy doing and just keep working, keep developing that motivation to keep your craft better and it'll all work out in the end. So, yeah. Okay. Could you, um, I know we mentioned, we talked about this a little uh, and you've referenced, you've each referenced it in your talk, but could you talk a little bit about how COVID affected how you work or yeah. how you are? Yeah. I can hey, go. Trey, why don't you go first? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for me, uh, it changed a lot because I was more focused on traditional work. And so with our studios being closed down because of COVID, I didn't have like space to do these big gigantic paintings up. And so that's when I started focusing on my digital work. And at the beginning, I wasn't nearly as good as I am now. So I had to like watch some YouTube videos, had to like take some classes on how to get better at it. Cause I had a short time to really get better before my thesis work. So, it was tough, but I think just trying to balance everything at one time was hard. But I'm the type of guy who's like making excuses for myself. So I had to like find a way to get through it. So that was the biggest thing for me, trying to go from like one style of work to another style. But I enjoy doing both, but yeah, that's my thing. Caitlin, I know it had a big impact for you. Could you talk about? um how COVID really transformed your work yeah I think um you know my my work was pretty consistent up until COVID um you know, I was very drawing focused um all of my projects sort of had this um kind of massiveness to them they were about like global mass extinction, um, global climate change, and having the opportunity to go home when COVID hit, I think it was like a transformative period in my practice um, because I was spending a ton of time um, in, the, in the natural environment where I'm from. So I was very intimately familiar with that place. Um, and I, I started to, and I had a lack of like studio facilities and materials to work with. So I started to, to incorporate those natural materials that I was finding in the environment into my work, um, you know, learning about, about the culture of that place and the ecology of that place and how those things overlap um, in a different way, just through the virtue of spending all of my time there. So my work does not look anything like it did before COVID hit, I think. Yeah, it's been a total transformation for better or worse. I mean, um, and I think too, like the the tragedies that have unfolded during COVID-19 are very relatable to the tragedies that may unfold with climate change and extinction. And, um, you know, I think I think the sort of mental health crisis of COVID is, is one of those issues that we could extend to other kinds of catastrophes and crises. Um, so I think that too is kind of in the back of my mind perpetually um, thinking about my work and thinking about COVID. Um, Anshel, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share about COVID? Um, I think, you know, with COVID, of course, there was the idea of adapting studio practice, you know, finding something first, finding a space where a space that you could have to yourself to make. But I also think that, you know, being at home gave me this moment of introspection about what I want to address through my work. Because I'd been thinking about the idea of internalized misogyny, but I could, you know, there was this aspect of censoring myself and that I was standing in my own way. And I think COVID really, you know, having that moment of introspection really gave me 
the time to figure out how I was going to talk about it and also the courage to pursue that. Yeah. Katie, do you want to add anything or? Oh. Uh, I can add something kind of silly. I didn't do any art over the summer until we got our studios back. I was just kind of um, on TikTok all the time trying to figure out what the hell was going on and trying to, I was like on political TikTok. <laughs> so I was like constantly traumatized every day about what was going on. Um, like so much so that I couldn't make art. I was just kind of absorbing information. So when I did get my studio, it was kind of like um, full steam ahead basically. Okay. Um Anshel, Kate has a question for you. The question is, how much do you consider color when planning your work? Um, do you make those choices before or during the process? So because I work with material that's already available, so the saris that I'm working with or the headscarves are material that are already there. So it's more about adapting to those colors. And you know, even with the making of the portals, it was very improvisational like that. So I have this sari, okay, what are other materials that can go with it? And so there was this, I was working from intuition. So the colors are sort of that sensibility that came through. Thanks. Um, Trey, uh, Nico has a question for you. Uh, would you ever like to create comics or some kind of story work with your characters? Um, he also adds the relationships you develop between them are really interesting. Um, but could maybe just talk about what the future of these characters. Yeah, are. sure. So uh, I've been working closely with Bob Dacey with uh, as far as like my work style and everything. And he had gave the input last semester that my work's a very visual development type of style of work. And so he wanted me to like create figures and like work that would like be relative to like an animation TV show or movie. And so going into it last year, I had to like focus my stuff on, okay, how do I make that happen for characters I've never seen before that I haven't had to create from my own from scratch to finish. So that was the hard part, trying to create the outfits, trying to create their personalities from their ground up. And once I had the ideas set, it was like, it was uphill. And, but it was it was it was tough. But I think if I were to continue, I guess these characters, I would like for it to be like an animated TV show or like movie or video game, maybe I don't know anything. Um, Caitlin, I've, I'm going to put two questions together, but I can come back to it. Um, Bridie asked, "What was it like when the leaves you embroidered died and changed colors? How did that impact the work for you?" We'll just start with that question. Yeah. You talk about working with the magnolia leaves and the changes that happened. That was, that was the tricky process um, because I could only work with them when they were really like fresh off the tree. Um, and luckily magnolias don't lose their leaves. They have leaves all year round. Um, so I had kind of constant source of, of leaves, but once they got to a certain stage of dryness, they couldn't, they became really brittle. I couldn't do anything with them. But depending what, where they were within that window of freshness, um, you know, some of them would curl in these really unexpected ways. Like if you look at the piece in the gallery, some of them are like really curly and some of them stay pretty flat. So there's that kind of unpredictability with how the material will react. Um, but surprisingly, they don't actually become that fragile when they dry. Um, there's something about poking it with a needle like a hundred times that, that actually accelerates that drying process. So they're almost like preserved specimens um, once they're embroidered. And I think unless, you know, they come into contact with some like moisture or something, I think they might last forever. Like the photo that I, I showed of the final piece, um, some of those leaves are like a year old. So um, they do kind of do their own thing, but they're very resilient um, after that point. Um. Another question um, was, was it hard working with such delicate materials? I mean, not just those leaves, but I'm thinking of the eggs and, and Anshel, I wanna ask you that too about that. But um, I, I mean, I think that fragility is so important to both of your 
choice of using such delicate materials, but um, how hard was it or what, what role did that play in your process to be work, having to work with them? Caitlin, do you wanna yes. start um, and then we'll, then I'll bother Anshel the same question. Um, it was definitely, I mean, there was definitely a learning curve to, you know, sewing the leaves and not tearing them. Um, but I mean, I have, I feel like because I'm already a drawer, like I have a lot of like manual dexterity. So it was actually a pretty natural process for me to, to sew these leaves. Like it's the kind of tedium that I'm like an expert in by now. Um, so it wasn't like, it wasn't too bad of a, of a process. I mean, I definitely lost some leaves um, while I was working with them. It would be really tragic if it was like an almost finished leaf because by that they take like four or five hours, like on a good day, if I'm going at a good pace. So if it broke at like the last, um, at the last second, that was always like a great tragedy. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the metaphor was, was more important to me and it, and it is also kind of about that tedium of feminine work of like, um, you know, patching clothes and sewing quilts and, and gardening and raising the children. Like there's a tedium to that kind of lifestyle um, that I wanted to represent in the process of sewing the leaves. So um, it, it was a challenge, but it was, you know, it was a meaningful challenge. Like I had, I feel like I had to go through that process. Um, Antel, yeah, you certainly share a similar uh, work ethic, you know, in, in this process and careful materials and yeah, definitely. a lot of time. Yeah. Could you talk, I mean, speak a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh huh. So especially with the egg, I think the first few days when I was trying to figure out how I'm going to start embedding the rice in the egg, there was, again, there was like this learning curve that Caitlin talked about, but then I got into the, you know, the momentum of it. And then it was more about, it actually became really interesting for me. And it was one of the things that got me through the pandemic, you know, making this work because I got up excited that I'm going to poke an egg with rice today. Um, <laughs> so the fragility was really about, it, for me, it was very similar to what I was talking about. You know, that's one piece where, the process, the material, it's all talking about this final idea of this life, which is, you know, at every stage, there is that fragility and uncertainty and you just have to work your way around it. So you just keep putting in the effort and the work sort of keeps growing like that. Could you each talk about, Madeline asked, um, how do you know when you're ready to go to graduate school? <laughs> and maybe what, what do you look for? But maybe just talk about could you talk about your decision to go to graduate school? I know Trey, you spoke a little bit about wanting to develop new skills. Could you could you start and yeah, talk a so, more about uh, that decision? Yeah. So, uh, funny story. I actually didn't want to do grad school. Uh, my last semester of undergrad, my mentor, who had graduated from Q, was like, "You should apply for grad school somewhere." I was like, man, I don't think I can because I'm sick of school. I'm tired. My mind is burnt out. He was like, look, if you want to get better with your craft, your art, you're young, go straight into it, get out the way. I was like, all right, well, so I ain't doing nothing else. So I applied to different places. And surprisingly, Q's offered the most like money for me to come. So I took that. Uh, so it was, it was a, a big change for me because I'm from the South, I'm from Mississippi. So I'm like 16 hours away from home. So new start, new people. It was just like really big for me and my family. So I was just like, okay, let me just try it for a year, see how it goes. So it's a, a leap of faith, if you will. So I was just, you know, it was nerve wracking, but the best things are, so. Does anyone else want to take that question? I will. Okay, Katie. Um I waited until I was, I think, 26, 25, um, mostly because I didn't, I didn't feel ready and I didn't feel like I had a body of work that was good enough to get into grad school. So um, I was showing in Cleveland, Ohio a lot. So that's where I was living at the time for, so out there for about five years. 
until I um, started applying to school. Um, and that's, that's kind of what was recommended when I was an undergrad to wait a, at least a few years before you apply to grad school because um, it did kind of take me time to figure out um, what I was interested in, who I was, uh, what I wanted to say. And um, I think that really helped me in terms of going to grad school um, um, and just seeing how other people um, transitioned into the situation. I think I definitely set myself up for success in waiting a little bit before I jumped in. Yeah, and going off what you said, Katie, uh, I think it varies from person to person too, because uh, for me being in traditional painting work, I think my piece was strong enough to guide me in any grad school because my mentor knew like where my skills were at. So he developed with me along the way. And over time, it just like helped each year. So I went straight into grad school after my undergrad. I went straight into it. And uh, I didn't want to waste no time. I didn't want, I didn't want to wait. Cause I, I knew if I had started making money outside of school, I wouldn't want to go back to school and like, you know, take out loans or whatever. So I just went straight for it. But I got lucky that, you know, he was like my work. So it just depends on each person I feel like. Um, another question, this is a little bit different um, from Sajin and I'm gonna maybe expand on it, but the environment and social justice are so intertwined. Does your work find itself ever intersecting with politics as you examine nature? But maybe could each one of you talk about what you think your, you or your work's relationship to politics are? Um, who would, Caitlin, how about, would you like to start? Yeah, I really, um, I like that that question was asked um, because even though I'm coming at this injustice from an ecological, like a natural ecological lens, it's all one problem. Um, it's all stems from the same um, system, from the same prejudice, from the same inequality. Um, so I really believe that like climate justice is social justice, climate justice is racial justice, like an economic justice, it's all of these things, it's all really one problem. Um, and I just am talking about it through more of the natural ecology lens. Um, but I think with the way my recent work is developed, like it became impossible for me to separate the environment from human stories. So, you know, relating it to Appalachia, relating it to um, my kind of maternal ancestors, um, you know, it, it, it becomes an incomplete picture if you don't talk about um, kind of kind of the human suffering that, that goes along with ecological degradation. Um, so yeah, I, could, I think that's, I, I could go on about that, but I think I'm gonna leave <laughs> okay. that that. Um, Anyone else wanna, wanna take that question? I think each one of you has, I can see it, but I don't wanna put words in your mouth. So uh, Anshel, how about you? Any, how would you yeah. define your relationship to politics and justice? I feel like, you know, I'm in this position of, you know, I'm here, but I'm also from India. So there is that, inherently there's that aspect of politics, the aspect of the relationship between the two countries, you know, because that affects my life and that affects how I'm talking about it. But yeah, I, I don't really know what else to add to that in other than that, yes, it's there. I don't necessarily address it all the time but I'm always aware of its presence. I, mean, I feel like your piece, um, the weavings, right? This idea of undoing misogyny yeah. and patriarchy, like undoing a political, the effects of a political system on you. That, yeah. that piece to me speaks very directly. I mean, that was yeah. definitely a relative experience, you know, mm -hmm. experiencing the culture here and then looking back. So that, you know, it's almost like I'm in this liminal space where I'm at the boundary of both the cultures. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm looking back at India, but maybe in a few years of time and experience, I can start addressing what I see here in America, but 
there's time for that. Yeah. And Trey, I mean, I, I so appreciate how you celebrate um, stories and people and histories, you know, and, and the importance for you of making those representations present, more present in the world. Could you, could you talk a little bit about how you, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of different political histories in your work. Yeah, um, so, um, actually for your class last year, um, I had only did like one piece that was like really political before. And it was the, uh, the Black Lives Matter when I showed in the talk uh, earlier. Cause I'm not a political person. I don't like, I will talk about politics, but like, it's just like when I ha I find myself talking to like people who don't listen to my side of the story a lot. So they want to always talk, always wants to be, you know, the last word in. So it's, it gets hard to talk about it, but I'm trying to like make more work about politics, human rights, because uh, I mean, I have a voice, but my art will speak for itself. And I think me being a black man in America, that speaks to some volume because, you know, I know when I put it out there, everyone won't agree with it because I posted some stuff to my art account and had like some very crazy comments about some stuff. And it just, it just, just people just like to start drama, like the troll. And I just, I know it's for, for fun, for fake, but I think for me, just trying to have like my say so what I view is important. Uh, equal rights for all people, not just a specific group of people. Uh, I think it goes a long way to keep those topics relevant because artwork will never go away. So once it's out there, it's out there permanently. So that's how I view it. And Katie, I mean, your work's abstract, but I, I see again from its rootedness in nature to also thinking about the role of the digital um, or the effects of digital systems on us as well. And I mean, you talked about wanting to have control in politics, but I think yeah. your work also offers a, some meditation, you know, some reflection upon imaginary worlds that we're living in. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I'm really focused on right now is this blending of like physical and digital reality in everyday life and how easily people's perspectives are shifted based on um, whatever like algorithm bubble they're in. Um, so I think that like, I'm always some, maybe it, maybe it's like, me being based in painting, but I'm always thinking of like, how, how is this manipulating the, um, the viewer or the, how, how is this manipulating the person that's absorbing this information? Where's the information coming from? Who's saying like context is always really important. Um, and then similar to Caitlin, I think like there, there's just like so much um, injustice with the environment and so much crap that we're just leaving everywhere um, in the oceans, they're, like just in my, in my own backyard. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a huge, huge issue. Well, just giant landfills. We're just selling trash to other countries to take that they put in their poor populations homes. People are like, I don't know, I, I could go on. But um, yeah, I think a lot of my work is like, it's essentially um, reflecting on those injustices and then also um, finding a way to evolve and adapt despite those injustices so that like, like my weird organisms are still thriving despite the fact that they're made out of, um, you know, tomato cages and fabric that's like, used and discussing. Um, so that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Okay. Well, we're getting close to eight. So I, I so appreciate you sharing your work and congratulations to all four of you. I'm really excited about you being artists out in the world again. Um, and just to everyone in the class, um, we made it through the year and I hope we all have a good and joyous 
summer. So thank you everyone. So.